Good morning, uh, sugar industry participants. Uh, sorry if we had a couple of gremlins in the system, but it's all been sorted out. Thanks, Bill. Basically, today I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to be using a dirty word known as diversification. And um, it's focused on trying to get value from the gas. And so we've done a lot of work here in the last five or so years around thermochemical technologies. I guess I just want to uh, draw to your attention what the potential of these technologies are within uh, adding value to the gas. Now, within my group, or within our group, sorry, within uh, CTCB, there's quite a few of us that work in this particular area, and those include Phil, Bill, uh, Darren, Lale, Adrian, Ian, Jen, and myself. So just to give you, for those who aren't familiar with uh, the Centre for Tropical Crops and Biocommodities at QT, it's a centre that's focused on, uh, I guess, the genetic manipulation of, of various feedstocks, the, I guess the, the pre-processing of those feedstocks and then the, the value adding opportunities. Uh, we also do a lot of work in obviously a sugar milling type of, of context. So we have uh, guys that work in, in the sugar milling industry looking at mainly the process of milling. The group also focuses not purely on sugar cane but also cover other feedstocks such as corn stover, sweet sorghum, banana grass, elephant and uh, uh, banana fiber. Excuse me. So uh, it's, a, it's a fairly large, diverse type of uh, biomass feedstock that we typically look at uh, trying to add value to. And they typically are, I guess you could say, herbaceous crops. So in this presentation, I'm going to give you a, a, first, a rundown of, first of things first, the actual chemical constituents of bagasse. What is bagasse? Give you an idea of, I guess, the thermochemical technologies that you, you can use to try and break down the gas into the various products. So we're discussing torrefaction, gasification, pyrolysis, with a focus on hydrothermal liquefaction. I will highlight the types of products that are generated from these technologies and I'm guessing where the value adding lies within those particular uh, technologies. And then I'll finally I'll probably give a, a rundown of some of the results that we've had from the various thermochemical projects that we've actually worked on and uh, give you an idea of the capability that we currently have in QT in this particular value adding opportunity area. So what is for gas? Now, for those who aren't familiar with the sugar milling process, it's a, in effect a, a waste product from sugar milling after the juice is removed. It's typically uh, incinerated to produce uh, processed steam that's used to, to drive our evaporators and our factories and alternatively used to produce steam to run through cogeneration type systems to make electrical energy. So it's currently used to some degree already within the industry. So the gas is composed in effect of three main polymer products. Those are cellulose, hemicellulose and lignin. The cellulose is in effect the fibre of, of the, of the um, of the gas. It's linked by a series of glucose monomers. Those who don't know, glucose is what's broken down in fermentation into to ethanol. It's composed of C6 sugars, obviously. It's typically a, a linear type of structure. And that cellulose is held together with lignin through, a, through um, I guess, the product the constituent hemicellulose. Hemicellulose composed of between 25 to 35 weight percent of the dry bagasse. It's composed of C5 and C6 sugars. Uh, for bagasse, it's typically xylan. That's the most common sugar you'll see in, in hemicellulose. And as I said before, it links uh, the cellulose to the lignin. The lignin, unlike cellulose and hemicellulose, is an, uh, a random type of polymer. It's composed inherently of, of three main polymers, or, or monolignols, and we denote those as being S, G, and H type structures. Unlike the, the previous two, uh, uh, like cellulose and hemicellulose, lignin is actually a composed of aromatic substituents, which is uh, fairly important because a lot of the chemical products that you see with regards to pharmaceutical compounds, uh, flavonoids, resins, and whatnot, are all derived from an aromatic type of product. So I'm just going to show you here what lignin is composed of. So it's composed of the, the, the guacol, or the G monomer, syringol, the S monomer, and uh, H or hydroxyl phenyl, the H monomer. And typically in bagasse, we tend to have more of this, this H monomer structure, and there's various reasons for that. So for lignin, it's arranged in a, a random type of system, and there are some carbon-carbon bonds, and there's some oxygenated beta-O4 bonds, but tend to be a lot more resilient uh, to, to, 
to break down than what, say, hemicellulose would be or cellulose. Okay. So what happens when we actually break down these uh, biopolymers into the various products? And we, we, there are various technologies that we can use. Typically, fermentation has been a very, very common pathway to, to break down uh, cellulose and all the carbohydrate structures. Uh, but uh, those particular processes, such as fermentation or pulping, don't really attack the lignin structure. And so the value that you get from those degradation processes really rely on the products that you can recover from the hemicellulose and the cellulose components. So just to give you an idea, as we, if, we, if, we, if we gradually break down a, 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 a cellulose product or a, through a fermentation or a popping pathway, we, we produce the constituent cellulose and hemicellulose uh, and leave them by themselves. And as we gradually increase the severity of the reactions, we tend to produce the, the, the monomers or the sugars. Uh, for, I mentioned before, for cellulose, it's glucose. Uh, for hemicellulose, it's, it's pr primarily xylose. As we increase those duration, the, the conditions further, we start to produce things like alcohols, acids, aldehydes, and, and CO2. So the, the, I guess the, the, the broader range of products one would expect from the, the, hard, the, the degradation of, hydrocarb, of uh, carbohydrate products. Whilst on the other hand, lignin, uh, particularly through a thermochemical pathway, because there aren't too many uh, other means of breaking down lignin, uh, you would tend to produce initially the lignin product removed from the biomass, then subsequently produce the phenolics, such as uh, phenols, catechols, guar guarcols, and a whole other range of other products. And then gradually as you increase the severity, you produce more things like alcohols, acids, aldehydes as well. The, the end product, generally with a, a thermochemical process, is normally a biocrude or a pyrolysis oil, or perhaps a biochar, and they, they tend to comprise a whole range of chemicals, so they're not as, not as clean as what you would see from the cellulose or the hemicellulose fraction. So I just want to kind of draw your attention now to why, why are we trying to add value to big gas? And I, I based, last week I got online and looked, looked at some of the most common commodity products, and there are, there are various market sites that you can go to, and they, they track the, the value of, of, of various com large-scale commodity products, and uh, from that you can get an idea of you know, what kind of chemicals are, what the chemicals are worth. So I've gone through that list and I've just identified the products that we typically see through thermochemical degradation or even fermentation degradation of, of the gas, and I kind of highlighted these into this particular table. And what you see is that you know um, a lot we have, and I've grouped into into to the various subgroups. So we have here the, I guess you can see the the acid groups, and these phase in Australian dollars per ton range between one thousand up to to four and a half thousand dollars, depending on the on the product. I then put in the, I guess, the, the aldehydes and the, the alcohol groups. Once again, they're, they're reasonably some large values there. And as we start with, we move into the, the phenolics, so these are the things that typically are derived from lignin, uh, we can see the values are, are still reasonably low, but uh, those particular aromatic products, we can then do a thing known as hydro-treating or upgrading and produce things that are more in par with uh, conventional uh, petrochemical hydrocarbons. So, for instance, you may have heard the term BTX chemicals. Well, that refers to basically the benzene, toluene, xylene chemical. And these are the feedstocks that one would typically see in, a, I guess, a, 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 a typical conventional crude. Finally, with lignin, uh, we do produce some reasonably high value products. Those products are things that you typically see in, in food precursors or well, ad food additives, such as, uh, for instance, ethyl vanilla, which is a chocolate substitute, uh, vanilla, and uh, some other, other types of, uh, I guess you could say, fragrances, so to speak. And I guess the true value in some of these, um, these products is, is when you actually polymerize them into, into subsequent uh, uh, like, uh, downstream processes, such as epoxy resin, polystyrene, where you have to see, I guess, a, a significant increase in that value of those particular products. That gives you an idea of, I guess, where the values lie, what kind of products you can typically get from the breakdown of the gas. Now we just focus now on what's the gas currently worth. Okay, well when we look at we think it's between forty to hundred dollars. It depends on I guess the scenario of the mill whether they have a cogeneration facility or not. And as you can see, you know, in our industry we tend to make you know probably the most lowest value commodity products in that whole entire system. And so you know, th there's a potential there to, to add value to this to, to the overall sugar milling process. So 
before I go into the thermochemical technology, I just want to I'll just bring you back now to some of the work that was done 10 years ago within the group around, I guess, a biorefinery perspective. And in that research, we, we looked at trying to do the minimum amount of degradation of, of the gas and using this, this, the products such as lignin as a whole structure as a substitute for, for various resins or various other uh, uh, plastics and whatnot. And from that process, uh, one of the, I guess, one of the, the benefits that came out of that, that initial bioframe work is a, I guess you could say, it's a, a process where we actually produce a, a waterproof paper and so it's coated with a, a lignin a, a barrier. And that particular process has now become commercial in what Bill tells me, I think six different uh, uh, facilities around the world. And so the research was done 10 years ago, but it's only now that we're starting to see the true benefits of this process starting to flow through. So I just want to attention that you know there is potential for these technologies to add significant value to the overall sugar milling process. So I'm going to discuss now particularly on thermochemical technologies and uh, what they entail. So thermochemical processing it basically means an upgrading primus to high value energy and intermediate products at elevated temperatures usually in a low oxygen environment. It's characterized by high carbon conversions, short reaction times, and typically a range of feedstocks. So you can put these technologies, you can use coal, you can use, say, mill mud or waste effluent streams within a sugar mill, and you can use these technologies to, to, to I guess, add value to, the, to, those, to those, those streams. Technologies I'm going to be discussing here mentioned before are torrefaction, gasification, pyrolysis, and really focus down on the hydrothermal liquefaction because that's where we see a lot of the benefits are for the uh, Australian sugar industry. So, torrefaction. It's basically a process where you you take your big gas, you, you heat it in an inert atmosphere, and you try and drop off a lot of that moisture. And the technology really comes about for the main purpose of trying to densify the the energy content of that big gas product. So I'm still still live. Yep, that's it's fine. I'm back on. It's okay. Um, so the torrefaction breaks down a proportion of the hemicellulose. It's a way of concentrating for energy density. It's flexible in the feedstock supply chains. Typically contains about 90% of the overall energy content of that biomass. You can improve that efficiency by, I guess, uh, using some of the, the volatile gases as a heat source to, to drive the process. But more importantly, it produces, I guess, a biochar or bioproduct that's hydrophobic. So you can store it. Uh, it won't spontaneously combust, and it doesn't have botulinum activity. So it, more importantly, it's a product that's very, very brittle. So a lot of these upgrading technologies or thermochemical, they require a certain particle size. And by having, I guess, a brittle product, you can, you can produce the particle size reasonably easy as opposed to trying to, to uh, grind the gas. So in 2009, um, a colleague who's, who's here now, um, Phil Hobson, did some work in looking at the benefits of, of torrefaction of the gas, mainly as a way of trying to reduce the ad value to uh, transporting uh, the gas or energy from one mill to another or to a, a co-located facility. And through that process, he identified that it wasn't really worth your value to, to add, to torrefy the gas if you're your sugar mill or your big gas supply was less than uh, 100 k's away from the, the facility where you want to gasify it or pyrolyze it. But if I actually started to go further distances, then it became economically justified to actually torrefy your gas. Just wanted to point that one out. Moving on now to gasification. Uh, gasification, as it says, is a, a way of converting the gas into a, a syngas uh, gas product. And that gas is typically used for um, to put through a, a gas turbine in order to produce power. It's typically a more overall energy efficient cycle than conventional cogeneration. It can also be used in a Fischer trope process to produce uh, diesel-like products, which can substitute directly into your, your, your existing engines. The technology has been around since the 1940s, 1950s. Uh, it was invented by the, the Germans as a way of, kind of trying to convert coal into, into diesel to, to, uh, to support their, their war efforts. However, typically uh, for biomass, particularly for fuels generation, gasification is very, very expensive. And there's only been one example of gasification to biomass, and the, the plant cost uh, half a billion dollars. 
and it's been ran for several years, but it's now currently idle because of the, the prices of, uh, of, of available crude oil. So gasification is a very uh, high capital um, in infrastructure investment, and so there aren't too many independent mills or mill consortiums that can actually support that type of technology. So Phil went further and started looking at the benefits of you know, torrefaction and gasification and looking at having a central type of location and uh, identified that for a single mill, the, the price of, of, of oil to justify gasification to fuels had to, to be at least $100. However, even to torrefy, torrefy that big gas and feed to a central location with several other mills supporting that, then you could get that value down to around $76 US per barrel. As most of us know, the current barrel price is around $62. So, basically, the technologies don't really stack up in the current uh, commercial environment. And the other thing I want to point out too is the fact that this there is is a high capital intensity. I mentioned it before, but these things are probably a bit lower than what we would expect in 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 the, in the today market. Pyrolysis. Uh, it's like gasification. It requires the biomass to be dried. Okay, you have to produce a fairly small particle size. You produce a, a bio oil that really has the same oxygen content as initial feedstock. So you're not, it's not really suitable as a, as a fuel unless you do some kind of upgrading stage afterwards. It retains about 64% of the overall energy and it tends to be on unstable mainly because the, the organic acid is still present in that system. You can do things to improve that. Uh, there were two commercial companies uh, at the time, Dynamotive and Enseng. As I understand, Enseng is the only one that's actually currently operational, and they're focused on producing products as opposed to fuels, and they're targeting various uh, niche markets in, in, in that particular product. The process is important because it produces also a biochar, and there's a lot of work done in the, in, in the industry looking at biochar as a, as a way of improving the fertility of, of various cane crops. So I'm now drawing you to a hydrothermal liquefaction. Okay, so this is a focus of, of, our, of, our, of our area. It's relatively low temperature. You operate between 250 to, sorry, 250 to 340 degrees Celsius. Sometimes you can go higher depending on, on what you're trying to break down. Has a, a typically a reasonably high overall energy conversion of about 75% is normal. Handles low quality feedstock, so you can do effluent streams, you can do sewage, you can do pig manure, you name it. It can handle, more importantly, it can handle wet feedstock. So for the gas, it's a good, it's a good probability because you don't put the energy into it to try and remove that 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 moisture from the system. And more importantly, it produces a biofuel that's reasonably stable and, in theory, has a low oxygen content. So what happens in liquefaction is that we typically have our our biomass. We add a liquid carry to that, maybe maybe a solvent. Typically for us, it's water. We slurry that up. We then under pressure to 400, 300 bars, but it's a high pressure process. We can add alkali carbon, such as sodium hydroxide, and some various other products. We use it, run it for a certain erection time, typically between 10 to 40 minutes, depending on what on the kind of chemistry that we're after. And from that, we can produce a bio crude, as well as a, a I guess a, a, a waste product, and uh, various alcohols and whatnot that are dissolved in that aqueous system. So this is a demonstration uh, unit, uh, a very, very small facility that was once operational in 2009. I think Phil made a visit to the, to the unit. And it gives you an idea of basically they've got a, a, a the gas preparation, a biomass feedstock. It's fed through pressurized. It goes through a, a, a series of, of, I can say, tubular or continuous uh, reactors. They break down the products and they separate out those products by doing a, a staged pressure reduction in order to get various oil fractions and to improve the quality of that product oil. So just a, a summary of where these technologies sit. So to the far right, we have gasification. Okay, it produces gaseous products, syngas, high temperature, relatively low pressures. Higher the pressures are more for, co -gener uh, for power generation scenarios. Pyrolysis are reasonably low uh, pressure process, uh, reasonably high temperatures, okay, but are very, typically a very rapid process within seconds to minutes. Liquefaction, a higher process, does use the wet slurry of the wet products and produces, I guess, a better uh, overall product, product, product oil. And finally, we have torrefaction, which is the way of producing a, a biosolid. We have solids, liquids, and gases. I just want to draw attention to a lot of the technology that we use. We tend to do a, a pulping study 
uh, we tend to do pulping prior to do some kind of liquefaction techniques. And pulping typically sits around the, the 200 degrees, 170, 200 degree mark and at the saturation pressure of water. So it's around 10 to, to 15 bar depending on the, the conditions. So how does handle liquefaction at QT? What have, what have we been doing? So I mentioned before it produces processes low grade waste, reasonably high overall energy efficiency, uh, reduced energy input to remove the water because we don't need to do that. Subsequent bio crudes produced. So most uh, liquefaction plants produce a bio crude. And to take that to a field product, you'd have to do a thing called hydro treating. That requires platinum, caddis, and, and other, other techniques, and potentially having to add hydrogen. But uh, our focus mainly in this scenario is, is really just on, I guess, producing a bio crude. So what happened? Um, in 2004, uh, Phil and myself were, have been putting in um, funding requests to SRDC trying to support this type of work. Uh, by 2009, they caved in and they, and they gave us the money to, to do the research. And we were awarded uh, $1.13 million to really to start to develop the infrastructure and the capability to try and understand this technology and add value to biomass. The objective of that particular project was to processing of the gas for biofuels, but also look at platform chemicals. Uh, within that, um, that, that project, we had uh, two PhD scholarships, uh, one for myself and one for a colleague, uh, Dr. Darren Rackerman, and uh, that was just to support the, I guess, in more detail, the work that was undergoing in the, in the general scope of the, of the semi-chemical project. Following on from that development, we, we developed the infrastructure as a result of this, this initial project. And that then put us in good stead to actually uh, uh, obtain additional funding of approximately six million in total for uh, uh, several research organisations. And within that, that total funding, um, QUT was allocated $1.4 million to, to develop more so the work in hydrothermal liquefaction. This particular project, which I'm referring to, is the AIS RF project. So it's an Indian industry sugar research fund from memory, this is terminology. And uh, it's focused on the laboratory and pilot scale work to develop and demonstrate integrated processes of biofuels from biomass. So we're looking at integrating thermochemical technologies with more conventional uh, uh, fermentation technologies. And in that particular project, we have now uh, four PhD students uh, looking at various aspects of the recovery side of the, the oils, some looking further into the lignin studies, and some looking at the, I guess, the transport of, of, um, of material from one site to not. So it's, it's, a, and it's a very broad uh, base with regards to the type of work that's been done in, in, the, in the, the thesis or the, in the PhD studies. So um, to start off, we, we first purchased a, a microwave reactor, and that allows us to do look at the very, very rapid heat up rates. That's uh, very important because we find that heat up rates have a big influence on the type of chemistry and how well you can uh, improve your overall uh, biomass, uh, sorry, oil yields from the gas. We uh, installed a, a, a liquid, uh, sorry, a, a pulping reactor. It's 20 litres at a Pacific site at Banyo and a, in a, a reactor room that's purpose built for this type of equipment. We also acquired from Syngenta a 7.5 litre stirred reactor, which allows us to do liquefaction trials at, a, a, I guess, a, a slightly larger scale to, to produce products that we can actually start to fractionate. We also uh, purpose built a, I guess, a, uh, a stand bath to allow us to do a very rapid heat up rates once again to understand the chemistry of what was going on in the gas or lignin as it broke down. And uh, we acquired through other various products, I guess, a, a solvent extraction facility to allow us to try and extract those oils out of the uh, the, the, the bio that we we're producing. We are also in the, currently in the construction stage of actually building a purpose-built uh, continuous reactor. It's going to be housed in a, a shipping container. It'll do about 100 mils per minute of the um, aqueous feedstock. It's a continuous, a, sorry, a continuous tubular reactor composed of uh, half-inch hast alloy uh, tubing, and uh, that that and it's got multiple heating sections. That that reactor is going to allow us to do look at staged heating, trying to optimise certain reactions, but also it will be coupled into our, our I guess, our solvent extraction facility to try and look at recovering much larger quantities of oil, uh, mainly for the intent of taking to to various. Uh, 
consumers to look at whether we're winning certain specs to, to meet the, uh, their product quality requirements. So that's currently in construction and we've planned to finish completion by October is the, is the planned scheduled date. For those who don't know, we've also have a, which is, stems more so the, from the fermentation aspects of the work done within the, the centre. But uh, we have a, a Mackay Renewable Facil uh, Biocomerce pilot plant. In that plant we have, I guess we have a, a rather large uh, reactor which allows us to, to break down the gas to do in uh, steam explosion or to do it in order to remove the lignin and uh, also we have a hydrolysis reactor so they, these these reactors are also used in a lot of what that we do to produce larger scale products for, for testing. We have developed I would say a, a reasonably good track record now in, in the biocrude analysis. It took us some time to, to get up to spec because of the issues that we had with knowing what was actually in that system. Uh, we typically rely on, on techniques such as, such as GC mass spec. So we, we, we produce an oil, we make it volatile, run it through a mass spec and we can determine those volatile components, what's in that system. We also use HPLCs, LC mass specs, similar technology. But more importantly, a lot of the information that we are now are covering is through the nuclear magnetic resonance techniques where we can actually start to really dwell down to what that structure looks like and how it's changing through the overall chemical reaction process. And that allows us to actually identify the reaction mechanisms, the pathways, and allows us to now identify you know, how best to operate the systems to produce various products. We've done a lot of, a lot of work with FTIR, uh, principally using principal component analysis. And then that gives us a big uh, a leap forward that we can do this test very, very quickly, and we can, we can understand the whole range of products within that oil product, and we can start to optimise conditions to maximise certain functional groups if we want to use that, that oil for a subsequent following on process. GPC, uh, in order to measure the molecular weight of the structures that we're producing as we produce uh, larger structures. Uh, TGA, to measure the thermal gravity analysis of the, 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 the degradation of the products, and obviously elemental analysis. So I'm going to talk to you now about some of the hydrothermal liquefaction results that we've currently uh, produced. Um, I'm kind of limited here in what I can present because of various issues, but I can talk to you uh, briefly about, I guess, some of the earlier hydrothermal liquefaction trials that we've done in the past and we first started doing these projects. And we set out and we started doing a, a screening of, of the, the, the application of the suitability of the gas to uh, generate uh, bio-crude. And we looked at various various variables such as the catalyst, whether we had sodium carbonates or whatnot. We then looked at process conditions. We looked at the reaction temperature, uh, the reaction time, uh, the catalyst concentrations. We looked at solvents, but also the headspace pressures, the operating conditions. So we did a whole range of, of very general studies and to try and to try and understand you know which directions we should be heading with regards to this technology. And the prim primary focus initially for the general thermochemical project was to understand what the oil yields were and on the solid yields, because you do make a solid product, but also what the oil composition was, understanding what kind of structures were in there and what those heating values of those oil products were. So I've just got a, an, list of an image here on the on this presentation of basically some of the oil yields that we were seeing and I guess what the heating value of those were. And typically through this process of, of making oil, we tend to make the bio-crude, we then do a diethyl ether extraction, and that removes a lot of the phenolic structures from that system. We then do an ethyl acetate extraction, and okay, that removes a lot of the alcohols and the organic acids, and occasionally we may do some kind of acetate extraction on the solid residue and also re recover some of the, the larger hydrocarbon structures that aren't soluble in water initially. Uh, from that combined three oil components, we get an overall oil yield of, of 40, around 40%, 45%. And the heating value here is still pretty low. It's in, in the range of about 24 megajoules per kilogram. If you compare that to methanol, ethanol, it's, it's equivalent to those products, but it's not really a petrochemical or diesel product. So it's still a highly oxygenated feedstock, and so it still has a lot of oxygenated compounds in that system. So in order to improve that, you have to do a, a hydro treating process. So what does this all mean? So just sitting back with regards to the, the intent of producing a, a biofuel, uh, the oil yields range for the early work between 38 to 45%. Energy conversion was reasonably low at, at 49, 61%. However, if you look at the price of, of the, the, the energy equivalent of, the, of that, that product, and you, you can then 
and you look at the value of a barrel of oil and its energy equivalent, you can kind of determine what the overall value of that uh, product would have been per tonne of dry fibre. And so in this work, we were working on a $95 per barrel price, and it means that the overall benefits was between $150 to $187 per tonne dry fibre of a gas, which is, is reasonably okay. However, with a $62 barrel price, the benefits are obviously reduced from between $200 to $125, so it's significantly lower. However, if you were to upgrade that, that product and produce a conventional fuel, so you're doing a hydro treating, so you're losing some of the, the, the mass of your bio oil, but you're producing a, a higher value product, and we, we, we believe that the value of that product per tonne is between $272 per tonne to $374 per tonne. Um, so um, once again, this doesn't consider hurdle rate or financial overall capital requirement. It just gives you an idea of where the, the value and potential is with, with those different technologies or applications. So how does this sit in the overall grand scheme? Because obviously there's a lot of things you can do within the industry to, to, to add value to biomass or the gas. Uh, based on our, our assessment, we believe for co-generation scenarios, you're looking to a value of about $87 per tonne. Second generation biofuels, $250 per tonne. Second generation hydrocarbons, $192. And obviously, pulping is much higher at $470. Once again, there's no merit here with regards to uh, the capital infrastructure required or the hurdle rate you need. But it gives you an idea that based on that previous slide, the, the $200 to the $300 is, is reasonably good and it kind of shows you a, a potential direction in, in that and in, in valuing uh, to the gas. As I said before, this project wasn't purely focused on, on uh, making fuels. The two PhDs were focused on actually evaluating of the various constituents of the gas to chemical products. And so for the PhD that I did, I was focused on adding value by breaking down lignin into, into various chemicals. And similarly, Darren was focused on breaking down the cellulose and hemicellulose to levinic acid and ferrofoil type products. So we know that the, relatively the value of the cost for a product fuel is reasonably low. The capital costs are probably likely to be reasonably high. So we had to then start looking, okay, what's the value to this biomass if we actually focus on looking at the chemicals that we can derive from this scenario? Uh, and from that approach, so we, in this scenario, rather than you treat your bagasse to uh, right through uh, to liquefaction, tighter treating, you got these type of products, the, the, the conventional fuels. If you, if you did a, I guess, an initial pre-treatment or a pulping stage, you could produce your black liquor or your lignin, run that through a base catalyst process and produce your phenolic products, okay? So you don't have as many variations in those products. Alternatively, in well, addition, sorry, you can also take the cellulose component and break that down into acid catalysis and, to, and produce levinic acids. And so that scenario, Straight away, as a result of that, you're, you've increased your overall uh, dollars per tonne of the gas to about $200 per tonne on dry fibre. Once again, it doesn't include uh, the, the hurdle rates and the financial infrastructure required for that system. So the conversion of, of black lignin. Uh, basically, we looked at um, various alkalis, tried to understand how they behave differently, and from that we could determine that some some products were stopped in, the, in their tracks as a result of different catalysts, and we can maximise certain yields. Um, we looked at the temperature variations, uh, resonance times, pressures, and lignin loadings. And from that, we've got a, a really good understanding now of how to maximise certain products in this from lignin. Okay, and we've been reasonably successful in regards to obtaining good oil yields. Um, but more importantly, we now have the tools to, to understand what's actually going on in this degradation process of lignin. For lignin, it typically tends to repolymerize as a process of this degradation, so you have to kind of hit it really hard to, to, to get where you want to with regards to uh, individual monomers. So as a result of the work, we identified that for particular conditions for what we were treating lignin with, we could get oil yields of purely phenolic oil yields, so of about 35%. Uh, but in that system, we still produce a waste product, and that waste product still has value, and they tend to be these long-chain fatty acids, okay, which is not included in that, that oil yield that I'm, I'm quoting here of 35%. We 
We also produce an additional 10 to 15 percent of products as such as alcohol and acetones and whatnot. Okay, so there's a lot of other products, but we're focused purely on the, I guess, the, the phenolic content. Now, in comparison to, to other, other techniques using very, very similar processes, uh, for whatever reasons, or for particular reasons, we were able to acquire, uh, I guess, I guess, a greater, greater overall yields than what we conventionally would see. Solid yields were also very low, and it must again depend on the conditions that we were operating in. For black liquor, okay, uh, if you take a black liquor and you do similar conditions, typically you've got much higher oil yields relative to the lignin content, mainly, mainly because of the fact that uh, uh, black uh, black liquor is composed both of lignin and hemicellulose, and there are some hemicellular structures that help depolymerize the the lignin further into these uh, sub sub uh, monolignal structures. So, so for lignin, you would expect, excuse me, around 25% um, to 35% oil, purely phenolic oil only. And uh, for black liquor, you would tend to produce higher oil yields, but that oil yield is going to contain more other types of structures or more variation in, in that product mix. I guess also, as a, I need to point out too, as a result of optimising the conditions, uh, typically for lignin, when you break it down, you would, depending on the conditions you choose, you could get to 35 to 40 different compounds in that structure. And as a result of certain conditions, we were getting down to three or four main base compounds. And so you could, there are is the potentials to add significant value to that overall process. I'm not going too much detail on this, but basically with lignin, it, it gradually breaks down from its native state reduce what is known as a technical lignin and various terminal groups start to, to fall off that structure. As you increase your popping severity, you tend to send more of these, so you see a great degradation of the, the xylo structures being removed from the overall lignin macromolecule. And then gradually as you, you heat it up, you reduce these linear chains or these, these uh, uh, oligomers and uh, I guess a lot of carbon-carbon structures which have value in other applications. For the oil phenolic content, you tend to produce these very highly oxygenated compounds. Okay, and they're pretty important because a lot of these compounds are the vanillins, the pharmaceuticals, the, the flavonoids, and so there's some value adding that you can add when you do very, very, you know, not uh, very low harsh condition reactions. As you increase your heart, ha your, your, the, your severity of those reactions, you produce things that are more in line with conventional fuels. Okay. I'm going to discuss now with you here regarding the conversion of carbohydrate rich streams. So this is the work that in effect was based on Darren's uh, studies. Um, so he's, he's breaking down both cellulose and hemicellulose into levinic acid and pharynx. Uh, levinic acid was identified as one of the top 10 chemicals from a, 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 a research organization in the States called uh, NRA, which is, uh, I guess our leader in this, in this particular area. What happens in this particular process? The hemicellular, sorry, the cellulose is broken down to glucose and subsequently onto levinic acid and, and degrades down to other uh, other products. While the hemicellulose, mainly to xylose in the gas, is converted to ferrophil and subsequently further on to levinic acid. Overall, you can once you, with this with this cellulose structure, you could have done. We could have also done a fermentation pathway to break into ethanol. Uh, we chose uh, the sulfolosis pathway because of the fact that uh, sulfolosis wasn't tailored to purely hexo sugars. Uh, it was uh, originally still a low temperature process, a very rapid process. Obviously, some fermentation pathways or, or technologies require two to three days, where sulfolosis takes uh, uh, less than is between minutes to 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 uh, less than half an hour. Uh, and overall, you've still got a very high, uh, conversion, uh, uh, high conversion of carbon uh, in that final product. So Darren looked at you know, various uh, feedstocks, uh, looked at ways to optimise the, the con various conditions to maximise his levinic acid and ferrofuel yields, and also different types of solvents in that system. Basically, he identified, I guess, a two-stage process was, was, was preferred in optimising you know, the overall various compounds. And uh, he identified that glycerol improved yields of ferrofrol and uh, total uh, levinates increased with glycol concentration and harsher action conditions. So from that work, he was able to get reasonably good yields. But more importantly, understand how the chemistry strange, changed through the different conditions and how to maximise those two different products. 
So what's next with the thermochemical? So the thermochemical project is now in its final stages of being wound up. Uh, we're now taking aspects of this work further in the, I guess, the grand challenge of the Indian uh, grand challenge type of work that we're doing now. So we're looking now at trying to add value, looking at ways of recovering these products more efficiently. We know that some of the technologies that you use conventional distillation require a lot of energy to actually recover these products. In some cases, the more energy you put in, obviously, the, the more big gas that you have to burn. So that kind of starts to bring the overall, the, the, the feedstock or the value of the potential uh, product down. So we're looking at ways how to better to understand the recovery process to minimise the, the, the steam or energy consumption. We're also looking at, you know, what are the broader issues that dictate these type of technologies with regards to commercialisation? Is it, is it, is it the... Is it the cane harvesting side of things? Is it the market issues? Why do have other things fail? So that's where we want to go with this technology in the future. We're also increasing, uh, we've, we've done a lot of work with a company called Pacific Northwest National Laboratories. In 2009, I visited the States with some lignin samples and we did a lot of upgrading. We converted, we broke the lignin down to, into conventional biocrude and then these, these chaps over there, which are, are well-known experts in this particular area, then upgraded or looked at upgrading those products into, into I guess, conventional hydrocarbons. We're also uh, doing a lot of work currently with uh, various institutes in Germany, mainly around the, the cane harvesting or the transport logistics side of things. So in summary, uh, in significant injection of SRDC and SRA funding uh, gave us the capability to develop the infrastructure and the tools that we need to actually understand what's going on in this degradation pathway and how to actually maximise certain products. Uh, from that, we've identified some value products that are very, very high at, uh, uh, adding. And so the future direction will also look at trying to recover those particular products. We identified that the overall high, uh, carbon conversion was for our system wasn't wasn't as great as what we typically see. However, the value adding potential was was still significant in comparison to other platform chemical production was um, identified. I guess higher value opportunity, and uh, I guess that's where we're trying to head now, given that the price of, of barrel being so low and the fact that you know, you've, you've really got to have some kind of mandate in place or some kind of, some kind of uh, emissions trading scheme to protect the industry if it need, has to produce these type of biofuels from this process. And as a result, I guess, of this, uh, this project, we've been able to develop, I guess, significant IP and, and an understanding of what actually is required in this overall chemical process. Just want to acknowledge the funding from SRDC and later SRA in, to actually develop these skills. Uh, also, in, 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 in this, uh, I acknowledge the, the federal government support in improving our overall overall yields, or uh, sorry, improving the, the chances of getting further funding. Uh, and I'd like to sorry, conclude with uh, thanking QUT for um, providing the, the in-kind support needed to, to develop this technology for the, uh, the continuous reactor. Uh, thank you. Any questions, folks? Michael, okay. who, who asks whether it's uh, worth mentioning the recently announced Biorefineries Research Grant with the Federal Department of Ag that's funding four and a half million dollars over the next three years. Um, I'll probably let uh, Bill or Phil answer that question. Uh, the, both my, I've got Phil and Bill in the same room with me as well as Jeff, and they're probably better to answer that question. I just Phil's just trying to get his microphone organised and his camera turned on, so Bear us for two seconds, he can give you a, a, a rundown as, as that particular project. Okay, perhaps while we're waiting for Phil to log on, um, Neil has asked, as a feedstock for these hydrothermal and value-adding processes, how does the gas stack up compared to other feedstocks such as wood chip, etc.? I can probably start to answer a bit of that question. It's probably more so Phil's question, but uh, one of the biggest issues with uh, producing, I guess, in, in the, for instance, biofuels focus, uh, you need to, to really drive value. You need to have a lot of the infrastructure with regards to transport models to get your biomass to the to the, the coast site. And a lot of other industries don't really have that facility. And so the sugar industry, in some regards, has some advantages in that respect because it's, it's already, in effect, you know, uh, existing. Uh, furthermore, the gas as a feedstock, um, okay. we know that the structure of of, of lignin and the gas 
uh, gives us some, some advantages in how far we can depolymerize lignin and then subsequently the kind of products that we get. So there are some benefits both from a terms of regards of the uh, the ability to harvest to a coast central like location, but also in the in the actual feedstock itself, there are some additional benefits because of the the structure is somewhat different to hardwood type species where you tend to see more GNS uh, lignin polymers, which tend to, do, to to actually repolymerize more and resist the degradation of lignin. I've got uh, Phil here to answer the questions regarding the Michael's question. Yeah, thanks Cameron and uh, good morning everyone. Um, just uh, to um, answer Michael's question, um, I think the, uh, our main thrust really in terms of future work is, um, is, is through the Australia India project in terms of the uh, thermochemical um, work that's gone on under SRA and um, in the, uh, the biorefineries research grants um, really the liquefaction side of things um, uh, is, 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 is not a, a major component of that. Um, there are other value adding processes going on but they, they, they essentially won't be, uh, they, they won't be via thermochemical um, uh, processes that we've, that Cameron's talked about today. Answers those questions. And Phil, did you have anything to add to Cameron regarding Neil's question? Uh, let me just uh, check Neil's question again. So I just mentioned the fact that we have a, a centralised model where we already have facilities to transport the cane yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, th I think, yeah, and, and I guess it's biggest and, and what that implies really is that its biggest advantage is that uh, it's available in very large quantities in, compared to other biomass sources and in a centralised point. So it's, it, it is potentially uh, relatively cheap as a, a feedstock. Um, uh, it's, there's also the possibility of um, using bagasse produced from cane trash, which the process will handle quite well. Um, and uh, the fact that cane trash has higher ash content than um, uh, than a conventional bagasse uh, is is not an issue for the for the process at all. So it is uh, it is certainly a, a a good feedstock from that point of view. Um, exactly how it con compares with wood, um, we we personally haven't we our group hasn't done a lot of work on, on that area, and it's really an area that we're uh, we're exploring under the Australia India project, um, so it's uh, it's really something that we'd uh, um, we, we'd be in a, in a better position to uh, compare um, uh, a bit down the track. Okay, right. Thank you. Now we do have another question from Mahmoud. He asks, are all processes of the sugarcane bagasse done at mill, or some of them can some of them be done at farms? Related to the costs. Oh, I'll have to answer that question. Um, are you say when you say are all processes, you mean um, uh, can can some of the liquefaction process be carried out um, uh, 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 remote from the farm? Um, it's not clear. I, I mean, I. I, I would say that the essentially you would want most of those processes to go on um, uh, at a central location. So uh, at a uh, at a um, at a factory would be ideal. Okay, great. Mm. Um, yeah. Another question this time from Highwell. What needs to happen to turn this research into a commercial facility? Well, certainly, I think. Uh, <laughs> Uh, 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 the, there is some further work to be done before we move to uh, a sort of uh, commercial facility. We're we're really only at the um, at the very small pilot stage, um, and we're we're currently producing this uh, continuous reactor, um, and that that's that's obviously a critical stage. I would say there's there's then got to be a, a commercial demonstration stage after that. Um, but uh, uh, yes, as I say, there's there's at least another couple of stages before before we can start talking about uh, commercial plants. 
terrific, thank you. Um, if anybody has any more questions, um, please type them into the chat box and Cameron and Phil would love to answer them. Um, in the meantime, we will let you know of our next webinar, of course, through our usual channels and as always, welcome any feedback that you might have, particularly on what sort of topics you would like to see in future webinars. Um, I don't think anybody's, oh hang on, we've got somebody typing so we should have another question coming through shortly. Is there anything, uh, Cameron or Phil, that Actually, I probably wanna, you'd like to add? I probably want to point out like, um, that the whole entire concept of making a biofuel is kind of a, a little bit unusual in the fact that we're staying with a feedstock that is already highly oxygenated. So we have to do a lot of work to break that feedstock down into a fuel type product. And realistically, um, we have... So we have to do a lot of work in order to remove that oxygen. Whilst on the other side, you have the petrochemical industry, they're trying to make these fine chemicals and these industrial chemicals, and they have to do a lot of work to add oxygen to their process. So it kind of seems strange that you know we produce these products that are already on par, equivalent to existing chemical production. Why would you want us to try and remove the oxygen to produce a cheaper value product if you can already make a value product that's equivalent, if not better, and cheaper? So I guess that's what I just want to point out. So for me, I think the focus uh, is probably on the, on the, I guess, the production of chemicals as, per, as opposed to the production of biofuels. But obviously, it's, it would be market issues that would dictate what direction you, you would go down. Um, now, we've asked and we often get this question whether this presentation will be made available to those that um, may have registered for the webinar but couldn't attend this morning. Yeah, um, so, is that okay? uh, yeah there shouldn't be any problem uh, with uh, sending copies of the uh, presentation around, no. Fantastic. Yep. Okay, terrific. <laughs> and Phil, did you want to add anything as a final comment? Uh, I think it's just, can I just make one last um, point as well that I think one of the main things to come out of this is that um, we we have been able to develop quite a strong IP position um, in this. Um, I guess a lot of the stuff that we have been working on very recently uh, we've not been able to present because we're in the process of uh, patenting it, but uh, essentially we 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 have a process that is um, that is very well tuned to uh, the gas as a feedstock, um, and we are able to now able to control um, uh, certainly the number of products and the type of products that are produced, but very importantly the number of products. So we can we can get a lot of the carbon into the in, into sort of our high value um, uh, target products, a, a few number of those, and we we now know how to do that. And um, and uh, I guess we've uh, we 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 believe that we're in uh, quite a strong position now to uh, uh, to take this to the to the next step and um, and t towards commercialisation. Terrific. I, I don't have anything well, further to add. Oh. No, I'm fine. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Cameron, for presenting today, and, and thank you very much, Phil, You're also. Um, thanks for joining us today, and we'll look forward to um, seeing you again at our next webinar.